cost analysis of that regulation. If they want to build a public project in some area, they have to, you know, do a benefit cost analysis of the value of building it there. But the same basic methodology can be applied not just to these sort of public projects or regulations, but to assessing externalities. So, for example, determining what the correct level of Peruvian tax is requires you to add up all the marginal costs and benefits associated with the activity to figure out what the overall uh, marginal harm is, what the overall real externality is, so this can be charged as the Begubian tax. Um, if you want to assess in a court case how much uh, damage was caused by some negligence that was taken, which we said is another way of instituting Begubian uh, uh, damages, economists are often called in to do a benefit-cost analysis of whatever the action that was taken that caused the harms was to determine the correct amount of the externality. Um, similarly, to determine the right level for cap and trade policies, you need to do an analysis of what are the benefits and costs of doing more or less of the activity. Um, and uh, these analyses are done usually by a combination of academics doing you know, uh, research in consulting uh, uh, capacities, by bureaucracies with, which hire economists within you know, various different administrations or regulatory agencies, and by the courts reviewing them to make sure that they meet the correct standards. Now, one crucial uh, aspect in you know, doing these types of analyses is, is technical. It's really what are the physical harms and benefits that, that you know, just physically follow from the actions that were taken. And this typically requires a detailed knowledge of a variety of uh, uh, sciences, including, for example, physics. So if you want to figure out what are the chances of a nuclear reactor spilling over and you know, destroying the area around the nuclear reactor, you need to know what's the physics of a nuclear reactor. And so that, you know, the optimal tax or subsidy to put on nuclear uh, energy is going to depend on doing that sort of scientific analysis. Another example is, um, I don't know if anyone knows about CERN, but this is this giant new uh, particle accelerator that they built in Switzerland. And there are, you know, sort of some lunatic fringe who thinks that there's a large chance that this is going to uh, rip the universe a new one, as someone uh, uh, put it on a website because, you know, they're doing things that are so high energy that it's possible that, you know, there will be, it'll create some, like, tear in the fabric of space-time or something just, like, blow up the whole universe, right? So, um, and, uh, you know, knowing some physics is quite useful to figure out what the chances of that happening are and, therefore, what the externalities of creating CERN are. Uh, chemistry can be quite useful as well. So, if you, you know, it's very useful to know atmospheric chemistry to know whether sulfur dioxide emissions are likely to cause uh, acid rain. Uh, or what will the effect of pollution be on the chemistry of a lake? Will it cause it to become so nasty that like no fish can live there? Or will it, uh, you know, will the lake be able to cope with it? Epidemiology can be really important as well. So if you want to know what is the benefits to other people of me getting a vaccine, and therefore how much subsidy we should put on vaccine, you need to know what's the chance of me, if I get the disease, transmitting it to other people. Uh, ecology can be useful as well. So you might want to know how the fish stock levels are affected by pollution or by overfishing in order to know what the externalities created by those are. Um, okay. Or what the ecosystem services values uh, of um, a particular forest star to figure out uh, whether deforestation is likely to be very harmful. But while all that's important, it's completely useless unless there's an economic analysis that's added on top of the scientific analysis. So, for example, you know, the Fukushima Daiichi explosion caused an enormous amount of harm. Uh, and knowing the physics of nuclear explosions uh, nuclear meltdowns would be really useful in preventing that sort of thing in the future and trying to figure out how much damage it will cause. But unless we can put an economic number on how much that is, it's really hard to make trade-offs of that against other things. Like we need to know the value of the land that was destroyed, how much the value of that land went down after the disaster. Uh, acid rain, we, you know, chemistry will tell us a lot about how much acid rain will occur, but it won't tell us how valuable are the crops that are destroyed by the acid rain. <coughs> 
Um, you know, uh, if there's a possibility of some catastrophic outcome happening, like the, the universe getting ripped a new one, we have to figure out uh, how we should put value on really low probability but really terrible events, right? And expected utility theory helps us think <coughs> about those things. Um, if we want to figure out how do we discount the future value of reduced numbers of fish versus the pollution value of polluting today, we need to think about intertemporal trade-offs, right? Um, when we think about ecosystem services and what their value is, we need to think of the chance of a discovery of a new medicine, say, based on some, you know, some animal living in some forest, and figure out what are the profits that will create and what spillovers those will have in terms of consumer surplus. So, um, similarly, when we think about, uh, you know, how much value there is for me getting a vaccine because I might transmit a disease to someone else, we need to not think not just about the um, chance of the disease spreading, but how much it hurts the other person that they get the disease from, right? We'll talk more about that in just a moment. So almost every useful analysis for public policy of these things is going to combine a detailed knowledge of the relevant science to you know, get some of the facts straight, but also a detailed economic analysis to tie that to the actual values associated. So perhaps the most famous uh, economic input into these types of analyses has to do with the value of human life. And this is quite a controversial topic because a lot of people say things like human life is, you know, invaluable. There's just no way to put a number on how much human life is worth. But clearly, anyone who drives a car doesn't think that. So uh, anytime you get into the car, you basically take your life into your hands. And I'm sure most people have at some point in their life driven a bit further in order to save a few dollars on something, right? And anytime you do that, you're obviously showing that you don't value your life in an infinite amount because if you <laughs> did, uh, you, wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't drive uh, any more in order to save any money, right? Um, and the society has to face the same trade-off, right? We could take actions that might make the society incredibly poor but might you know, save one person's life. Uh, or have some chance of saving one person's life, but that doesn't seem like a very good trade-off, right? So in our individual lives and in our lives as a society, we have to make trade-offs about uh, human life versus other uh, economic resources. And one thing that that's going to imply is that the wealthy um, are going to be willing to spend more to try to stay alive and, and on their safety than our other people, right? So like a, a rich person would be much less likely to drive to try to save a few bucks on something if they know that driving is risky, right? Um, and, uh, you know, basically as you get wealthier, the amount of utility you're going to be earning during the time that you're alive is greater. So that makes you willing to pay more for it. And you just have more money, right? So what that means is that a rich person's life is worth more than a poor person's life is which everybody thinks is just totally uh, scandalous, but, it, but it's actually, in some sense, just common sense, in the sense that, um, so if, a, uh, if there's any inequality, right, then people are going to have, some people are going to have more of some things, and other people are going to have less of those things, right? So maybe we object to all inequality, and in fact, I think that's quite reasonable that we want to redistribute wealth, and we'll talk more about that later in the course. But given that we have some inequality, shouldn't the poor person be allowed to decide whether they want to live longer but live in a small house, or live shorter but uh, live in a big house? Those are the sort of choices we let people make all the time. And so as long as there's any inequality in some things, there's going to have to be inequality uh, in other things as well, right? So that poor person could probably choose to have as long of a life as the rich person did, but they'd have to spend nothing on anything else. And so as long as they don't end up doing that, what that implies is that the poor person gets less house, they get less car, and they also get less life. So um, there uh, are basically three categories of things, therefore, that we're going to need to measure in order to measure the value of a human life. 
So the first is just to get some measurement of how much people are willing to pay to reduce some, by some probability the chance that they die or are injured uh, in some way. Um, second, they have to, um, we have to estimate, yeah, the value that they'd be willing to pay to reduce the chance of being injured, not just dying. And the third is that they need, we need to figure out how the value they're willing to pay to avoid those things varies with their income. And basically what's been estimated is that the income elasticity of willingness to pay for life is approximately 0 0.6 to 0 0.8. So what that means is that someone who makes $100,000 a year is willing to pay about one-seventh of what someone who makes a million dollars a year in order to save their life. That is, their life is worth about one-seventh of the life of someone who makes a million dollars a year. Okay. Now, the usual approach to measuring this uh, is that first, we need to make an assumption that people don't care about how they die they only care about whether they die. Um, so uh, the reason that you have to do that, which is uh, obviously that's a very problematic assumption, but the reason that you have to do that is that otherwise, you know, we're only going to have data on some particular ways in which people die, and we have to be able to extrapolate that to all possible ways people could die. Uh, and that requires us basically assuming that people are just as happy to die from asphyxiation as to you know, pass away uh, peacefully in their, in their sleep. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, a second thing we need to do is to look for cases where people have made trade-offs. So, um, for example, deciding whether to take a dangerous job where they, like a coal, be a, a coal miner, where they might like, you know, die in a coal mining accident, rather than taking a nice job like being in a, um, uh, being in a, like, store or something like that, right? Um, another example of that might be people decide whether to buy a really safe car like a Volvo, or like a, you know, sexier but less safe car <coughs> like a Porsche, right? Um, uh, third, we need to figure out um, how much people were willing to pay for one option versus the other. So we can look, coal miners make $60,000 a year, people with similar skills who go to work in a store make $30,000 a year. That indicates that the person who's just indifferent between being a coal miner and being a, a, a shore, store clerk is willing to pay $30,000 a year to avoid the risk associated with being a coal miner, right? But this only measures the willingness to pay of the person who's just indifferent between the two of them, right? Because people who really don't want to die are going to be the store clerks, and they'll uh, be willing to pay a lot more to avoid the accident. The people who are the coal miners presumably value their lives less, and therefore are uh, willing to pay less to, uh, to avoid the accident. So this only measures the marginal person's willingness to pay. And then, uh, despite what I just said, we have to assume that everybody cares the same amount as the marginal guy does, right? Um, so what I just pointed out is that there's a ton of problems with using this approach. But uh, it's sort of all we've got. So uh, even though it's problematic in a lot of ways, the thing that's useful about it is it gets us sort of like a rough ballpark figure that rules out things that are like clearly silly in either direction. So these numbers indicate that sort of a median American um, values their life at about somewhere on the order of like five to ten million dollars. And so that rules out that like programs that would, you know, pay a hundred million dollars to save a life are not worth it. And programs that would, um, you know, only cost a hundred thousand dollars to save a life are clearly worth it. And things in between are much more complicated. But just having that basic ballpark number can rule out a lot of really stupid things in either direction. Yeah. Um, so um, you said that like there's like economic studies that show people value their lives approximately like five to million dollars. Yeah. Um, does that value change as they get older? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't think that anyone's really looked at that, but in principle, it should. So I think that people have ways to adjust these things for sort of like the amount of like quality adjusted life years you have left. So there's actually like a more detailed version of this, which is adjusted life year rather than the statistical value of being alive or not. 
And so then you can get people's willingness to pay for each quality adjusted light year that they, they get. But I think those are much less developed than, than these types of studies are. Um, now, another thing you could do is you could survey people about how much they're willing to pay to stay at their left. But I think that you'll see that those are not very reliable for some reasons we'll talk about later in the class. Okay, <coughs> so let, let me just take a simple example of how this, this sort of a calculation would work, because it might be useful on your problem set. Um, so imagine that every year, three um, in every 2,000 coal miners die, right? And suppose that factory workers have comparable skills to coal miners, um, but that only one in every 2,000 factory workers dies each year in an accident. And imagine that the coal miners uh, earn $4,000 a year more, and that the only relevant difference between the jobs is the risk, then the chance of the um, difference in the chance of death is one uh, per 1,000, and in exchange for this you get $4,000, and that would imply that it's worth $4 million to stay alive. So that, that's basically the type of calculation that you do. And this says that the statistical value of the life for the person who's choosing between being the coal miner or the factory worker is $4 million. Does that make sense, sir? Okay. So um, the real calculations that are done, even though if you look through them they'll look very complicated, are really just no more than complicated versions of this. So all that they're doing is they're trying to find um, people who are like as similar to each other as not as possible and compare the decisions that they do and control for all the differences in the different work, but, but basically they're just doing this calculation. Um, and I think what's nice about looking at this is it shows you all, all the things that are problematic about doing this type of a calculation, but it also lets you sort of know how they arrive at the numbers. And to calculate the income elasticity, you try to look for a rich man's home line. So you look for something that rich people do that's, that's somewhat dangerous. Um, and, and then you try to you know, figure out how much they're willing to pay, take the difference between those, and then look at the different scenarios. OK, so I, I doubt you can really read this very well. But this is a list of a whole bunch of studies like this that have been done. Probably the two most reliable ones are this viscousy. Uh, 78 and 79, and this Viscusi 81, and they find 4.1 and 6.5 million dollars in the uh, at, in those years. That's probably gone up by a bit because the economy's grown. So I would say that probably the value is somewhere on the order of about you know six to ten million dollars for a median American's life at this point. Um, but someone, if a median American is earning you know forty thousand dollars a year then someone earning $4 million a year, uh, and there are certainly people like that in the United States, are probably worth willing to pay something like 50 times this much. Right? So their life would be worth $500 million. Okay. So now I want to turn to sort of the most ambitious example, probably ever, of a benefit cost analysis, which was the Stern Review of the Economics of uh, Climate Change. And this was commissioned by the British government along with uh, some other international governments. And the goal was to evaluate the benefits and costs of climate change for the world. And um, this report uh, proceeded in several stages. And Ajoa, are you here? No, she's not. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the. Um, first. Uh, these, the analysis set out to determine what were the largest sources of greenhouse gases uh, for the world. And Maria, uh, do you remember the, uh, what were the largest sources of greenhouse gas? Like methane. Right? Methane is a really important one. And, um, Where does methane come from mostly? The animals? Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the second most important one, yeah. Fossil fuels oh, are the fossil most fuels important are, one, right? Like yeah. Uh, and then the third most important one is deforestation because the forests like soak up carbon. Yeah, but that's right. <coughs> um, and then it uh, tried to figure out what were the effects of these emissions on the global climate. And Sam, how did they how did they do that? Um, 
They try to use climate models. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of variables in that. Yeah. That it talked about. So. Yeah. No, that's right. So they used climate models, to which are these giant models made by people whose job is to predict what happens to the climate when different, you know, gases are around. Um, and these are filled with a huge amount of uncertainty. Um, the reason why they're so uncertain is that, uh, you know, we have very little history of observing the global climate, and so there's very little to base these things on. So the goal was less to get a particular number of what the impact of a certain amount of gases would be, but rather to get a sense of the range of outcomes and how those shift as the gases are put in to the atmosphere. Um, and then uh, the next goal was to determine the economic effects of these changes. And, and David, <coughs> whoa? Yeah. Oh, hey. Uh, what were the um, <laughs> impacts, what were the most important economic effects um, of predicted of global warming? Yeah, farm productivity was definitely one of the most important ones. Um, and uh, an another one was natural disasters might increase in frequency. Um, there's also like flooding. So as the water levels rise, they might uh, inundate cities. Another thing that could happen is just direct harms or benefits that people don't like it to be so hot or don't like it to be so cold. Uh, if they don't like to be so cold, that's actually a benefit. So I think Chicago might not be so unhappy about a little bit of global warming. Um, uh, then they needed to figure out to what extent um, adaptation, that is people like moving away from uh, places that are likely to get flooded or away from places that are going to get too hot, might mitigate some of these harms. And Calvin, uh, what, what, how, how could they figure that out or how did they try to figure that out? Or? Um, well, like, I suppose it's more modern. People, if people change, like they, they move somewhere else to another place, like how 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 much should they gain and how much should they lose, right? Yeah, so th that's that's definitely one thing you can do. You can also look at historical incidents where there was some sort of a disaster and look to what extent people moved away to and and that reduced the harm. So the Dust Bowl is a very good example of that. There's a famous study of what happened. <coughs> when, so the Dust Bowl was this case where uh, basically the um, soil all got dried out in Oklahoma, and all these people left Oklahoma and migrated to California. And you can look at how quickly people moved out, and therefore how, how much that reduced the, the harms that were caused. One real problem in terms of uh, that sort of adaptation making things better for climate change is that the incentives aren't really in place. So, you know, a lot of people lived in Louisiana, even though it was incredibly prone to flooding, and we saw how bad that was in Hurricane Katrina. And the reason, one of the reasons is that they don't pay very much for flood insurance because the government just comes in and bails them out every time uh, there's a flood rather than them actually having to buy insurance against them. So um, you can do similar things for other effects of uh, climate change uh, or even just the greenhouse gases themselves. And, and Shen, what were some of the um, other impacts of climate change beyond uh, you know, the, these direct economic effects that I was talking about. The other environmental impacts? Right? Yeah. Like, like uh, desalination of oceans. Yeah. That would be one example. Exactly. Yeah, so like the, all the carbon in the atmosphere can make the um, oceans more, much more salinic. They, that can kill off a lot of fish. That can destroy ecosystems. <coughs> and then you can try to calculate what some of the harms of that might be. Okay. Now, corresponding to the distinction between cap and trade and, you know, calculating the optimal Pigouvian tax, there are basically two approaches to um, calculation that were taken in the uh, Stern Review. And Osama? Is Osama here? Uh, the first approach was to calculate sort of the marginal harm, for, given that what the world we're currently in, of introducing a little bit more uh, carbon. And that was a way to calculate sort of the optimal Pigouvian tax. 
And the benefit of that is it didn't require any estimates about the economy, really, other than uh, you know, just the calculations we were talking about. It didn't require any projections about how cheap it would be to reduce greenhouse gases or anything like that. Right? It just required knowing what the physical impacts would be and what, how those would translate into economic consequences. And so it's, this is a lot simpler to do, a lot more transparent, and requires a lot less assumptions. But the drawback is that the effects of climate change can be very highly nonlinear. That is, if we go beyond a certain point, things might really go to hell. And before that point, they might be a lot uh, less bad. And that means that, um, that it might be really useful to get the right amount of carbon and try to figure out how to get there, rather than just figuring out how much harm it's going to do given the current situation. And so this led to an estimate of about $85 per ton of carbon as the optimal, as the marginal externality. Um, the second uh, approach, which was closer to cap and trade, was um, to actually determine what would be the socially optimal level of total carbon. And this deals with the nonlinearities that I was talking about a lot better, but it requires an incredibly detailed understanding of all the ways that we could reduce the amount of carbon and how costly those would be so that we can you know, do the calculation of what would be uh, And this led to an estimate of about 450 to 400 and 550 parts per million of uh, carbon in the atmosphere. Um, and I think what's useful about this exercise is less the particular numbers that come out of it, but more that how it illustrates how hard it is to do one of these analyses. And you know, this analysis had like you know 20 of the world's top economists involved in it. The IPCC models that it was based on had 50 Nobel laureate uh, scientists and about 2,000 other scientists involved. And still everything is incredibly uncertain, quite sensitive to all sorts of assumptions. So for example, um, there's, there's these ideas about geoengineering, that what you could do is you could, if the cl climate starts getting too hot, you could put sulfites into the atmosphere. And th these are like reflective particles that would reflect some of the sun's rays and cool down the earth. And that might, uh, at you know, relatively low cost, solve uh, at least solve the most extreme problems. Now, it might also cause acid rain and do all sorts of other bad stuff. But if we were like getting into the point where we were going to go into a death spiral and like the world was going to blow up because it was just getting too hot, then uh, that could avert that. And in fact, a lot of the harms associated with climate change come from the possibility of a really catastrophic thing rather than the most likely scenarios. And so if that's able to get rid of those, then climate change might actually not be nearly as harmful as this is suggesting. So even with this incredibly detailed analysis, it was still a quite uncertain and difficult process. And it completely left out a lot of the sort of more personal or softer benefits or harms of climate, um, even though these could be very important or large. So for example, do people like it being warmer or colder? Or do they like it uh, being rainy or dry, etc.? And this might seem you know, very frivolous, who cares? But if you look at the price of real estate in Chicago and compare it to the price of real estate in San Francisco, there's like an enormous difference, even though I think maybe San Francisco is a little bit cooler of a city than Chicago, but I think Chicago is a pretty cool city, and yet people are willing to pay like four times as much for land in San Francisco as they're willing to pay in Chicago. Right? So that indicates there has to be something pretty darn good about California, and probably a large part of that is the weather. Right? Um, and so there's a question of how you quantify this. One thing you might do is compare these different land prices, but you know, that requires an approach, and that was never done by the Stern Report. If global warming turned Chicago into California, that might bring a huge economic benefit that could offset a lot of the harms associated with this. Right? Um, OK. So um, another question is, how much do people care about all the animals that might be extincted? by uh, global warming. Um, it's quite difficult to quantify in an objective fashion. You could use a government decision about this, but, but it's quite tough. 
Another thing is that, you know, if New York City gets flooded, or if there's like whole civilizations that basically get wiped out because they're on islands that get submerged, how much value do we put on that? We probably put more than just the value of the lives and the property destroyed because we have some inherent value for that civilization existing, but that's a hard thing to, to put a value on. Uh, another thing is that, you know, many farmers might know how easy it is for them to adjust to the climate change. And that might be really hard for outsiders to know because it depends on very local conditions. Similarly, there might be some inventors or innovators who know how easy it would be for them to come up with new technologies that will reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. And uh, it might be impossible for the government to know that without asking those people. So all of these share the property that just science and expertise and external evaluation is not enough. We actually have to sort of ask people uh, what, is, what they need. Okay. And this is true for a broad range of situations, actually. So anytime there is sort of subjective, what are called existence values, which are like, um, you know, we, want, we don't want some culture to die off. We want some language to keep being spoken. We don't want the pelicans, uh, you know, to die, etc. cetera. Um, we could either say, well, there's some expert who's in charge of figuring out, out how valuable that is, or we could um, get from individuals how much they're willing to pay to keep those things there. Or you could combine those. So it might be that people don't know that much about, you know, the pelicans in particular, but they have some sense of their overall value for environmental improvement, and you could combine that with an environmentalist assign, uh, you know, sense of which things are most important to try to get a, a, a sense for it. Um, another thing is if, you, if there's property that has a personal sentimental value to you, like something that was given to you by your grandmother or a house that's been in your family for generations, it's very hard from the outside to determine how much you value that property. You need to get from that individual what their personal value is. So you don't know how bad the externality that causes that house to be destroyed is until you figure out how much that person valued that house. Um, another, another issue is about local information about the impacts of a disaster or about technology. You know, entrepreneurs might know about how to mitigate climate change better. Farmers might know how badly his farm will be affected by things being very dry. A New Yorker might know how subject his place is to flood risk in a way that's harder to calculate from the outside. Though there's a question of how much of that stuff there really is, and people can debate about that, whether the people really do have that local information, or at this point we can calculate using science things better than sort of anyone locally can do. Okay. So when this stuff really is important, and it's important that we get a sense of it to make real social decisions, it's going to become very important to find a way to get people to tell us this information that we need to make our decisions as a society. And it's, it's important that this not just be uh, an opinion or a guess, or that we not just say that, well, just because this person thinks this is worth this, that must be what it's worth. We actually have to think about the cases when it's really important and they have really important information that in order to make any reasonable decision, we need to get a sense of. Um, so, for example, in thinking about the inherent values of the survival of a culture or a civilization, we could either think about this in terms of how much society as a whole values this, and in which case it might be useful to just have some anthropologists think it through with a philosopher and you know not bother everybody about it, or it might be you might think that it really matters how much each of us individually values that society continuing to exist rather than just us as a society as a whole. Um, and when we do need to get that information about how much each of us values something, uh, one approach is we can just ask people. Um, so this is a very traditional approach and has a very long history, and it's traditionally called contingent valuation, which is just a fancy word for surveys. So what you do is you go to people and you say, here's situation A, the pelicans are still alive. Here's situation B, pelicans are dead. Uh, how much would you be willing to pay to have the pelicans alive? Um, and then assume that this is what they're actually willing to pay. And then use that to make some public policy decisions. 
So this is most commonly applied in environmental issues, but it's also used for transportation uh, and for public goods and other situations. So, uh, you know, um, what are some examples of situations where continued valuation has been used? Um, Yeah, so like a forest, yeah. for example. Uh, preserving the visibility of the Grand Canyon. Um, uh, preserving seals or whales in the ocean. Avoiding logging in na uh, national forests. Uh, saving the birds that were killed by the accident of Valdez spill. Preserving the languages of indigenous cultures. Building a new building that's beautiful in a city. So uh, these are all real examples that have been done, and they tend to be commissioned, and there's many, many of these each year, by regulatory agencies or courts. And um, these usually form part of a benefit-cost analysis of, of regulatory action and externality, et cetera. Um, and they are also used to assess the damages from various different things like an oil spill. Uh, and, of course, those are just ways of you know, assessing externalities, right? Because, as we discussed in the last class, damages are exactly a way of internalizing externalities. So, um, some of these surveys are, as I described, sort of formal and based on money. So, we say, how much are you willing to pay for this versus this? But there's also less formal ones that are more just like surveys of the public uh, saying, you know, do you support the following thing, or do you oppose it, etc. So in some sense, you can see politicians relying on public opinion polls as being a bit like contingent valuation, but certainly a much simpler form of it. Right? Okay. So most, despite the fact that these could in principle be used for a lot of things, economists tend to be very skeptical of contingent valuation surveys and Siraj. Um, what, what, why, why do economists not, why are they not very sympathetic? Um, because um, people might not uh, really know how much they value these things when they're like, answering the surveys. Yeah. And so um, there's not really a real incentive to give an honest answer. Yeah. Or um, give you like, true value of how much um, these things are worth. Yeah, so there's a bunch of reasons that. Uh, just like what Suraj was saying is that one thing is, you know, imagine someone came up to you with a clipboard and asked you some of these questions. Would you really take them seriously? Like, w would you just be trying to get rid of them, basically? I mean, that's like how these things run. But, uh, you know, a second thing is that people might give their overall evaluation of how much this is worth to society rather than the evaluation of how much to them personally it would hurt not to have the, you know, seagulls uh, in, in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's what we actually want to know, is how much it's worth to them personally so we can add it up across people, right? Um, uh, a sec another thing is that, as Siraj was saying, people might just have no idea what they're even sort of talking about, right? So, for example, if someone said to you, do you want to preserve the following forest? And they just gave some name. That could be referring to, like, like the trees in some guy's backyard, and you just gave it a name. Uh, or it could be referring to like one of the most important like rainforests in the world, right? And like, how is anyone supposed to know what you're even talking about, right? So it doesn't seem very reasonable to like ask someone, "Would you like to, you know, preserve this type of, uh, you know, whatever?" Unless the person has a pretty clear sense of what the heck you're even talking about, right? Um, and more importantly, maybe people like have no experience with this sort of decision thing in their life. But like, if you ask me how much am I willing to pay to get like a really delicious fresh rather than like a Tropicana orange juice, that's a decision that I make every day, and I could give you a pretty good number. But, but like, you know, if you ask me how much am I willing to pay to keep the, you know, um, Hikoto language from like going extinct, you know, whatever that is, I would be like, I have no idea, I don't even know if that's the language, you know what I mean? And like, <laughs> <laughs> it probably is it, or maybe it is, but there's like 300,000 languages uh, in the world that are like you know going extinct. So who knows? 
But I mean, it's like, how am I supposed to come to some sort of a judgment about that, right? Um, and furthermore, people often answer these questions not based on like what they actually think or value, but on like what makes them feel good about themselves. Like a lot of people would feel really good if they said, oh, I'm willing to pay just like some enormous amount to save the environment because I'm such a good person. But they don't actually have to pay the money. So, so it's, you know. Um, and uh, this is sort of borne out by the fact that if you ask people different, the same question in different ways, you get completely different answers. So if you ask people, how much would you be willing to pay to stop one historic building of 10 historic buildings in a town from being knocked down? You'll get one answer. You then say, how much would you be willing to pay to stop one historic building of 100 historic buildings in a state from being knocked down? You'll get a different answer. If you then say, how much would you be willing to pay to not, you know, one historic building of 1,000 in a country, you'll get a different answer. You know, just because it will all be relative to the number of things. So it's like, it's very hard to get a reasonable answer out of people on these things. Um, okay. So, uh, things are actually even worse than this, which is that um, when people start, yeah, go ahead. Um, what about pay third base? Do they reduce, do they like get more people to take the survey? Or pay survey so like they pay more? <coughs> they definitely get more people to take the survey, but that doesn't mean people take it more seriously. Like you're, I, I would be happy to take some money and then just like randomly answer the question. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, so, uh, what, the problem is, things get even worse when you start thinking about what are the incentives that people actually have. And this depends on what the survey is used for. So the survey might actually be used to make a public policy decision, or it might just be used for like me to have an example to give you in class, right? Um, now, what if no one takes seriously that the survey is going to actually be used for public policy? Uh, uh, Zha Ling? Uh, what, what are people's incentives if nobody is really going to take the survey seriously? So if no one's really going to like make any decisions for society based on this survey that we're taking, what, what are the responses that people have an incentive to give? Yeah, I mean they, they just have exactly what we were talking about. They don't care. Mm -hmm. It's just like they have no incentives. <laughs> they just say whatever they feel like saying. Um, and in fact, uh, unless someone's paying you, like, why would you even take one of these surveys? Like, people come up to you all the time trying to get you to take these surveys, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Like, I'm going to spend ten minutes here with you for some like completely pointless survey that like no one's really going to use for anything. Um, uh, so, on the other hand, imagine that these are really serious, and there's going to be major public policy decisions made on the basis of this survey. Uh, then, Isamar, what do you think the incentives? Um, people would be. Well, they would like pay people to take them or like offer them prices for it, I guess. No, but what, what do you think people would have an incentive to respond in the survey? The question. Oh. Um, well, they would have, if it's actually going to be used, they would actually want to answer it, so they would want to take part of it, so it would be larger than Well, Tejas, do you want to follow Well, up? I was just wondering, so isn't voting then like a type of survey? Because you're trying to find like who's the best candidate? Yeah, but there's an important difference. Well, I'll get to that in one minute once I finish this answer, but I'll, I'll tell you about that. Maria, did you have a Yeah, isn't it like it depends on where you stand on it? Yeah. Too? Like if you yeah. have an like incentive to that added process so that you save the animals and you save the lunch. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So like, imagine that you're someone who really wants to see the environment saved. You might only be willing to pay $1,000, but you know that's more than it's going to cost you. Then you'll say, oh, it's worth a trillion dollars to me, right? to get them to do it. On the other hand, if you don't want to see them say, even if it's worth something to you, say, oh, it's worth nothing to me, to try to get it not to happen, right? Grishan? But uh, so how does that like solve the problem regardless of uh, like, people just uh, answering questions randomly? Because like, they, they might, the public policy issue might not be exactly relevant to them. I mean, most public policy issues that are like big deals <laughs> matter to somebody, right? I mean, maybe they don't matter to everybody. But if, if it matters to you, like if you care anything about the environment, you you want to say a huge amount, you know, to try to get them to save the environment. If you think the environment is stupid and they're all a bunch of tree huggers, 
you want to make sure that we don't waste money on that, right? So, uh, but Patentius's question is, is a good one, which is that, um, you know, if this is a lot less extreme, what I just described, if it's um, like just you're voting, like should we do this or should we not do this, not how much are you willing to pay, because then you can't exaggerate, you can just say yes or no. You see what I mean? So that's actually one thing that works really well about voting, is it doesn't let people like exaggerate how much they care about something. Um, so even though voting is not going to be efficient, you should keep in mind that voting actually has some nice incentive properties about it. Um, okay. So, um, basically you never have an incentive to report truthfully in this situation. Either you're going to exaggerate way in favor or way against. Um, and I think a great example of this was um, an article I read in The Economist. So The Economist went around and was like asking a bunch of uh, people in Haiti after the earthquake, have you gotten like supplies from the um, Americans and you know from the uh, United Nations? And everyone said, no, we haven't gotten anything. And then they went around to their houses and their houses look at these boxes and boxes of like UN delivered stuff. And they're like, why did you lie to us? And he said, well, you know, if they realize that we're getting stuff, they're not going to send us any more stuff, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so uh, that is the problem with these types of things. So um, if we want to take seriously the responses that people give in these surveys, we actually have to think more carefully about the types of incentives and how we can give them incentives. So um, suppose that we know the amount of private benefit created by some activity, right? That, that's, those were those marginal private benefit that we saw yesterday. And we wanted to determine the socially optimal amount. And imagine every person knows how much they're hurt by the activity. And so the total harm to everyone is the sum of the harm to the individual. So like in the smoking example, imagine we know how much benefit people get out of smoking, but we don't know how much each person dislikes having smoke around. And the total amount that society dislikes it is the sum of everyone's, right? How can we get people to tell the truth about how much it harmed them? Well, um, one approach is to just push the question back another layer, which is say, when I report that it harms me a certain amount, that hurts other people, potentially, because now they're not, not going to be able to smoke or the price is going to be higher for them to smoke or something like that, right? And um, if I have to pay for the externality that I cause by saying that it harms me, then I'm going to tell the truth. Because anytime I pay the externality of something I do, I'm going to do the right amount of it. Right? So the question is then, what are the externalities of me saying that it hurts me that somebody smokes? Um, well, without me, you can think about what harms would be um, caused. So you can say, uh, in the absence of my saying that the smoking hurt me at all, how much smoking would occur? And then you can say, with me saying how much it hurts me, how much smoking would occur? My externality, then, is the difference in everybody else's welfare from the effect that I had on how much smoking was going on. So the externality is others' welfare with me, me minus others' welfare without me. So let me get, let's do an example of this in the smoking case. Now imagine we're in a small room, and the value of smoking to one to the one smoker is 100 s mi minus s squared, and there are two other people uh, who's each harmed s squared plus 5s, whereas you are harmed a little bit more than that, s squared plus 10s. So what is the optimum if you say that you're not harmed by smoking at all? Uh, Edwin. Edwin Olivas? Yeah. Um, you can come up and do it on the board if you prefer, or you can do it there, or whatever you want. Yeah, maybe do it on the other side because that graph we're actually going to use, so might as well leave it drawn. Yeah. 
no, so that's his, that's his total value, right? Yes. But you want to know his, you have to set his marginal cost. Yeah. Okay. Right. It's just the derivative, right? Yeah. if you, we now include the harm to you in this calculation? So that's exactly um, what happens. The amount of smoking goes down from 10, 15 to 10 once we include the harm to you. So what's the externality that you create? Well, it's how much value there would have been, well, to everyone else if you hadn't participated versus how much value there is to everyone else if you do participate. And key sum? Uh, could you come for this problem, compute with the externality caused by your reporting that you did? Yes? So without you, there's smoking of 15. With you, there's smoking of 10. What's the value to everyone, total value to everyone other than yourself? So it would be like... So the value of everyone else was, let's see, it's 100, so it's 110 times, sorry, no, it's a 90 times 15, right? Yeah. Minus, 15 minus 3s, minus 3 times 15 squared, right? So that's the value they get if I don't say my thing. But now imagine that I say that I get the amount of smoking down to 10, then how much value is created for that? Just, so 10, right? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, and do I have a calculator to give you to do that? Well, here's the calculation. It's 75. So everybody else loses uh, 75. Uh, I don't even think I did this correctly. Where did you get the 90 from? This is wrong. Where do you get the 90 from? Two times yeah. five. Is. What? It's 100 yeah. minus 2 times 5. Okay. Right? Well, let, let's, I think I, I did this a slightly different way. But anyways, it, I, I, if anyone else wants to verify that that's correct, you can. But I, I think it's 75. Yeah. What did you get? Okay, so this is the value to the smoker is 100s minus s squared, and then you subtract the harm to the other two people, so 2 times s squared times plus 5s, right? 
and that's the total value to everyone other than me. Right? Okay. So you pay $75, right? If you report that your true value, but you're happy to pay uh, $75. Why? Well, what do you gain from the reduction from 15 to 10 in the amount of smoking? You save, uh, here's what you would get if it was 15, and here's how much you lose when it's 10, and so you, you gain a benefit of $125 from that reduction, and so you're happy to report the harm caused to you. What I just described is called the Vickery-Clark-Groves mechanism. So we can show it in this graph here. So imagine this here is a harm to everyone other than you. And this is the harm to you. The total harm is the horizontal sum of these, right? So without, uh, total harm is the vertical sum of these, sorry. Oops, this was drawn. So this is the harm to you, this is the harm to everybody else, this is the total harm to society, right? Then the amount that would be done of smoking without you is this much. The amount of smoking that would be done with you is that much. The harm to everybody other than you of this reduction is that much there. And so that's what you're forced to pay. You're forced to pay that Harburger Triangle, which is the harm to everybody else as a result of you having said what you said, rather than saying that it didn't hurt you at all. That's the Vickery Clark Groves mechanism. Okay, so this is if the quantity of smoking is quantity of smoking is on this axis. And this is the marginal harm slash benefit. This is the marginal benefit to the smoker. This is the marginal harm to everyone else, to others. And this is the marginal harm to you. So this is the total harm, total marginal harm. And so, when you tell the truth about your harm, you raise the curve to here, and therefore you cause this dead weight loss to everybody else other than you. And that's what you're forced to pay, the harm that you cause to other people. Okay. So, um, the most common practical application of the Vickery Clark Groves mechanism is what's called the second price option. And Tejas, could you describe what the second price option is? Um, look at it's a little bit. Is Samar, you want to go? Um, well, it's like when items are auctioned off and the highest price winner wins, but they pay the second price. So the second highest bidder. Yeah, the second bid. highest. It's yeah. Well, the highest bidder wins, but they pay the second highest bid. Exactly. Um, so, uh, so everybody bids for the object, and the winner pays the second, the second highest price. And why is this his externality? Yeah, go ahead. I have a question about yeah. going back to the theorem. Isn't my harm, though, compared to everyone else, is going to be so small so as to make the externality of what I say almost nothing? Often. Okay. But in, in that case, you know, that's okay. Yeah. So, uh, this will be a case when your externality will be large in this auction thing. So, you, so in the auction, um, what happens is that... Uh, when I bid, right, what's my externality? It's that the other guy who was bidding before doesn't get to win. 
right? And so when I win and I just beat a guy, my externality is how much he was willing to pay, right? And so that's how much I should pay, how much he was willing to pay, right? And that's exactly the idea of the second price auction. Now, um, note that you always want to bid in this auction exactly what you're willing to pay for the object. Why is that? Well, first, notice that how much you pay only depends on whether you win or not. It doesn't depend on exactly what you bid, right? Because it only depends on what the second highest person bid. It doesn't depend on what you bid. Now, you never want to bid less than what you, it's worth to you, and as a result, maybe lose the auction, right? Because imagine that there was someone between what you end up bidding and your value, then you could have bid just a bit higher than him, and won it, paid less than what it was worth to you, and you'd be better off, right? Similarly, you never want to bid above what it's worth to you and end up winning for that reason, because if someone bids above what it's worth to you but less than what you bid, you end up winning and paying more than what it's worth to you, and you're worse off, right? So you always have an incentive to bid exactly what it's worth to you. And all that the Vickery Clark Groves mechanism is is a generalization of this. So one way you could think about that is imagine that rather than auctioning off one thing, we're auctioning off a hundred things, right? And they're all different. And in fact, this happens. So the U.S. government auctions off the right to the spectrum that the cell phone companies use and that the television companies use to broadcast and to allow you to do telecommunications, right? And the way they do this is that they slice up the country into all these different regions. They, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, are all the bids made simultaneously? Yeah. Um, oh, and by the way, one version of this, which is very, very similar, which is used even more in practice, is um, just an English auction where, like, people, you know, the price is rising and people say, do you want to bid a little bit more? And, you know, people raise their hands. You can just think you have in the back of your mind at what price you're going to stop bidding, right? And you always end up paying the price at which the next person drops out of the auction because you just pay a little bit more than them, right? So that's actually very similar to a, a second price auction. Yeah? Um, wouldn't you also bid your value if it was, like, a, a first price? Like if it's no, because then you're going to want to reduce your value to bid just a little bit more than what you think the other person's going to bid at the auction, right? Because then you're forced to pay the price that you uh, bid, and that's really bad for you. Imagine that you know that the other guy's only going to bid $10, and it's worth $100 to you. You'd bid $11 just to beat him. You wouldn't bid $100. See what I mean? Yeah, eBay's like this too, right? You say how much you're willing to bid, and then it keeps bidding for you, and so that you're just beating the next guy. Yeah, you're right. So is the second price auction like a like a sealed bid kind of thing? Or it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. So is, doesn't that mean there's some incentive for people to bid slightly above what they value the object at? Maybe no. They, don't have, they, they have an incentive to bid exactly what they value it at. So if you want, imagine that we were trying to, rather than bid, auctioning off one thing, auction off this whole like set of different spectrum across the country. And some companies might want to get, like, you know, a little bit of spectrum all over the country so that they can, you know, be a net nationwide telephone network. Another one might want a lot of spectrum in one area because they're a TV channel, etc. <laughs> so then you can't just say, well, what's the second price? Because there's no one thing. There's all this different stuff. So what you have to do instead is say, if I hadn't bid for anything, what would have the allocation of all the stuff been? Give the, given that I bid, how much worse off is everybody else who bid? And that's how much I have to pay. That's the natural generalization of the second price auction. Yeah? How is this uh, different from like the Dutch auction? The Dutch auction is very similar to a first price auction. So what happens in a Dutch auction is the price starts high and then it c comes down. Right? And so what that means is that people um, are going to drop out of the Dutch auction uh, sorry, people are going to raise their hand in the Dutch auction to buy it at some price, and that that's not the price where they necessarily think that it's worth to them. They're just trying to stop somebody else from getting in before them and grabbing it. Okay. So that's much more similar to the first price auction.
So it's like the reserve price versus like their value. Like uh, in the Dutch auction, you're going down to your reserve price. No, in the Dutch auction, you, you're going down to not a reserve price, just to whatever you're willing to offer. You know, it's, it's very much like the first price auction. You're trying to figure out what's the, what, what's the point at which the next person's going to get in. And I want to get there just before him. It's not that I'm going to raise my hand at my value. Right? Okay. So this is also used over at the Booth School for how they give people courses. So people get, have like a bunch of artificial currency. They can bid for a group of courses. And then they have to pay however much value the other person would have of getting into that course and so forth. Um, and there are many proposals to use this in practice. And in fact, one is related to a paper that I wrote. So rather than having eminent domain where the government comes in, just takes someone's property and then pays them what they think is a reasonable compensation, instead you could have the government say, here's how much I'm willing to pay to take the property. The person could say, here's how much the property is worth to me. And then they could each, or there could be a lot of people that they want to take it away from. And then everyone could have to pay their externalities on everybody else as a result of that happening. So that, that's one proposal that's been made. OK. Uh, that's, that's, I guess, all I have to say. So I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Good luck with the problem set.